Thanks so much, Ron. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be here at the South by Southwest EDU amongst such kindred spirits. I know many of you are focused on how education and technology can work together in powerful ways. At the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, we're building a new kind of philanthropy that leverages technology to help some of our most toughest challenges, from preventing and eradicating disease, to reforming the criminal justice system, to supporting teachers in their efforts to improve learning experiences and student outcomes for all. Within our education work, including our grant making and collaborations with many like you who are on the front lines of this work, we want to help make sure that every student, not just the lucky few, gets the education that they need and deserve. One that's tailored to their needs and supports every aspect of their development. We believe this starts with taking an evidence-based approach uh, that thinks about their needs comprehensively. In short, expanding the definition of success beyond academics to their physical, mental, social, and emotional well-being. And we know that teachers are key to unlocking those outcomes. Let me tell you about three examples that I'm particularly excited about. One of our partners is Valor Collegiate Academies. Using a whole child approach to learning that supports their social and emotional development of students and teachers, Valor has turned what many think is possible for students on its head. For the fourth year in a row, economically disadvantaged students at the Tennessee-based schools outperform their higher income peers statewide, making Valor some of the highest performing schools in the state. A group of Maryland teachers we support has worked to develop NeuroTeach Global, an online professional development approach that uses learning science principles like feedback and repetition to help teachers apply the science of learning in the classroom. Last but not least is the Summit Learning Program, which is used by more than 300 schools, 3,800 educators, and more than 72,000 students across the country today. De developed for and by teachers at Summit Public School, the program provides these communities with free access to curriculum, professional development, and an online tool called the Summit Learning Platform that helps students connect their long-term goals with their daily actions. CZI engineers are working with Summit teachers across the country to make sure that the, this free tool meets their needs and helps them in their quest to build stronger relationships with students. Teachers are provided with real-time information on how students are doing, how, tools how the tools empower teachers to more effectively tailor their instruction to meet the individual needs of each student. When I was a teacher, I would have killed for that. The Summit Partnership is still in its early stages, and we are learning more every day. We're learning, we're, we believe that we're in this for the long term and committed to working with teachers to improve their model. Now let me be clear about what we don't do at CZI. We are not and would never advocate for a world in which students sit alone in front of a computer screen and allow technology to take place of the teachers. Nothing can ever replace a teacher. And the use of technology to support student learning must always be done in a way that protects their privacy, security, and confidentiality of their data. By giving educators the ability to customize learning to address the unique needs of each student and help them learn at their own pace, we're aiming to create learning environments where each and every student knows that they are supported and can succeed tomorrow, no matter where their level of achievement is today. But don't take it from me. Here's a clip from Summit Learning, a Summit Learning School in southeastern Texas, Bondi Intermediate. As a teacher, it's very difficult to, you know, meet the needs of all learners. I have kids who have learning disabilities. I have kids who have language barriers. I have kids who are high achieving and it becomes very difficult in a traditional setting to be able to reach every one of those kids and meet every one of their needs. Some of that soil to like hang on. Summit Learning is a program that allows students to be in an individualized, personalized learning environment. I feel like that's going to improve our water quality. They can look at a platform and it gives them the opportunity to learn at their own pace and they can choose how they learn best. 
all of their curriculum for the year is held in the platform, all of that shows up instantly in the progress feed. It gives me everything I need at my fingertips. It's grouped, it's color coded. I can walk around the room and really be focused on what that individual student needs at the moment. And having that information there is key to my success as a teacher. The engagement level is a huge difference from a traditional setting to a Summit Learning setting. Before I started teaching on the Summit platform, it was chasing down papers, like turning this, turning that. But with the Summit program, there is a mentoring tool in there that allows me to sit down with each child. I've never known groups of kids like I have with Summit. <laughs> Where did you get the example? I'm able to like celebrate each student individually and I love it. Thanks, Liz. At the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, we're thinking about how do we help support school innovation. Partnering with Summit was really a no-brainer for us. We bring the expertise in building software and we rely on educators to set the vision for what should this model be. I love that I have the opportunity every single day to walk into a classroom and inspire kids. Isn't that incredible? Now to the real reason you're all here today, to hear from two renowned experts we're lucky to have on our team at CZI, Dr. Burr Saxberg and Dr. Brooke stafford Brizard. Brooke leads our whole child development work and Burr is an expert in the area of learning science. Together, they're working to ensure that tools we're building are informed by an understanding how children and their brains develop and how they learn throughout their lives. As a pediatrician, I was always consulting with the latest medical research to help my young patients grow and develop. But in education, teachers have not had consistent or quick access to the latest information to fully meet the needs of their students. That certainly was the case for me as a classroom teacher. Unlike in medicine, where the practice is continually informed by the latest advances in research and scientific discovery, the linkages in research and practice in education are not always there. The cost of that disconnect is huge for teachers, but even more so for students. That's why I'm so excited about the work that Brooke and Brohr are working on. This, but this just isn't just about CZI. This is about us collectively, collectively deciding that we can make education better. We hope that in partnership with you, we can reach as many students as possible by making sure that educators have the tools and research that they need to inform their work in the classroom. And by and joining them to moderate the conversation today is Betsy Cochran, the co-founder and CEO of EdSearch. Before starting EdSearch, Betsy served as the executive edit editor for technology at Forbes Media, a staff writer at the Washington Post, and in the board of editors of Scientific American. I want to thank each one of you for the work that you're doing to put students on a path to success. We are excited to continue supporting the heroic work of educators like you every day. Thank you, and please welcome Roar, Brooke, and Betsy onto stage. So hello, and congratulations. You have made it to the end of South by EDU, or very close to the end, and it is a huge testament to you and to your focus on education, your focus on learning, that you are here today. Uh, as Priscilla said, my name is Betsy Corcoran. I'm gonna moderate our conversation. You all do have, uh, should you have a cell phone, there's the Slido app, and we encourage you to also ask some questions and be part of this dialogue, okay? So we're gonna start with something pretty easy and straightforward, which is Brook and Broer. What the heck are you guys doing? What, what is your, what's the difference between the jobs that you have at CZI? Well, the, the first thing is to think about the CZI education group. What are we all trying to do together? And what we're trying to do together is figure out how do we get all kids 
the skills, the capacities, the attributes, uh, and the agency to have a fulfilling life for their entire life. So that's kind of the overall piece that we're after. And then between the two of us, there's a number of ways to talk about it, um, but Brooke's work is really focused in on I'll let Brooke tell us. Yeah, how, exactly. What, you know, the what of learning. Yeah, well, and I would say we, we tend to focus not on what's different about our work, but why it's so important that we deeply integrate it. Um, so in many organizations, in the way that we talk about this, we might put learning science over here and all the whole child work over here. Um, but we really think about how uh, we draw from sciences and disciplines across uh, human development and learning to inform uh, the, the framework that you see up here on, on the screen. And so the what is a framework that's grounded in multiple sciences of human development and learning. And this is how we define whole child. So you'll see academic development is right there in this work. So we don't uh, define whole child by everything but uh, academic development. Um, we also name social emotional development. So that includes skills like stress management, uh, resilience, curiosity. Um, you see cognitive development here because as we look at the frameworks out there that kind of focus on, frankly, a false dichotomy between academic and SEL, we drop key cognitive skills. Um, so skills of visual processing, executive function, which includes working memory and cognitive flexibility. Can you shift your attention at the right time? We also name identity development uh, because we want to learn and ensure that we incorporate uh, the research on how we support every individual child and adolescent's unique, authentic sense of purpose, their personal identity, their cultural identity, their collective identity within communities. Um, and in a lot of spaces, that's imposed on students. They're told what their purpose is. They're told what their identity is. So we're learning so much from partners in the fields of social psychology um, on how to kind of really focus on uh, individualizing this for, for students. And then you see physical and mental health here, because um, you can't tease them apart in the human being. So we don't when we think about the whole child. Right in the center of the framework is context, because we'll talk a lot about this today. Right. Um, you cannot uh, separate an individual and in their development from the context that they're within. So that's relationships, environment, community. All of that is critical to support learning and development. And so that what? is deeply grounded in the science of learning and development, and, and it's how our, our work is connected. So I'll let Brewer say some more. Well, and so once we start to get a bead on the what of learning, what are the stages of development as a whole, where are we trying to go uh, to, to have a young adult be successful, well, then the obvious question is, how do we achieve this? And again, it's very related to context. Depending on what the students are bringing in, where they're coming from, the how of achieving this multidimensional success will vary. There's a lot of different lines of research that we can apply to this, but the key for us, for both of us, is how do we make this practical so that we wind up being able to help teachers with their students apply evidence-based practices in that incredibly complex crucible of work, which is live teaching. So it's not just about research at all, even though my area is called learning science. It really is how do we put it to work for uh, learners and especially for teachers in classrooms. So there's been a lot of conversation, including here, about personalized learning, which has had an element of technology involved. And really, Brooke, what you've described is what people often refer to as sort of whole child learning, mm -hmm. particularly something that's so focused around context. Are these two at odds? Not at all. So uh, if we define personalization as deeply understanding every student's strengths, passions, areas for growth, the context that they're developing in, uh, we need to uh, think about all of these domains when we think about that. And so technology is a tool to support that um, in addition to the deep relationships and in-person work that we do with students. Um, but if you look at these different domains of development, in order to personalize uh, based on that definition that I gave you, you have to understand um, if that child's not getting enough sleep, if they're living in unhealthy conditions, if they're having um, challenges with trauma or relationships, all of that is critical to support them engaging and learning. Um, and 
uh, we need to personalize in these, these areas as well. So we say you know, personalization is about ensuring that we don't take a one-size-fits-all approach to math instruction or literacy. Mm -hmm. It's the same for social-emotional development. And so if we're thinking about self-regulation and, and a student's ability to de-escalate when they become very emotionally upset, some students might need to sit quietly and go through a mindfulness practice. Some students might need physical activity. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all, and so we need to think about personalization in all of these domains as well. So Priscilla mentioned a couple of examples of places where this work is really going on, but I'd love to dive into some examples. I mean, what does this really look like in a classroom for a teacher? How much are we talking about really changing practice, and how much are we talking about building on what may be great practices there? Yeah. Want to start with that? I'm sure I could start with uh, an example of a, uh, a program that actually works in real school, started in Australia 15 years ago called High Resolves. And what it does is provide opportunities for students to begin to understand the value of global citizenship skills and actually begin to build those through practice and feedback. And so they've used learning science to actually lay out a sequence, multi-year sequence of these activities that start with peak experiences to get motivation and engagement in the ideas behind some of this global citizenship. And then they have uh, in-classroom experiences that teachers can run to build the muscle memory around how do you really do these kinds of things, uh, in fact. And finally, they have outlines for community engagement kinds of projects to bring those skills and ideas outside the classroom, connect them to the community, which is what you need to be able to have students do to bring them more richly into their own lives uh, later on. And just diving into that for one moment, you said they start with learning science. So just give us a little bit more detail. What does that really mean? And how is that different from saying they start with the best practices that they've had for the last 10 years? Well, so the good news is, you know, best practices for teaching are not at odds with learning science. Yay. So it's not, it's not that this is like magic. It's rather they have intentionally recognized that you need to first get students' interest in order to get more of them willing to start, persist, and put in mental effort into something new, and hence a peak experience across the class that's fun and engaging, but also provides a twist to get students to realize, okay, something is different here. Then that's, a, that's awakened students to why this might be interesting. But then the point is you can't stop there because it requires real work to build the muscles for empathy or for group involvement or for civic engagement. And so they consciously said, we're going to space this out over time. So that's spaced repetition, which also comes out of learning sciences work. And then finally, that idea that you need to then engage with the rest of the world in ways that are interesting and motivating to students by finishing with experiences like that. And again, that, so that all, it is what best teachers will do, but it's, they've done it quite systematically grounded in the evidence about learning. So again, it sounds like it's fantastic practice. It sounds like this is what the best teachers do, but you're also adding an element of intentionality and an element of rigor. Brooke, talk a little bit about what rigor means in this context. Sure. So, you know, rigor means kind of rigorous and disciplined attention to these principles that Bohr talked about. And so if you're but thinking- But does it mean measurement? Does it mean testing? Does it, what else does it mean? If measurement is that rigorous feedback that you're getting as you are supporting the process of learning and development, yes. Um, but if you think about uh, in the social emotional space, I'll give you the example uh, that Priscilla mentioned in her introduction of Valor Collegiate. Mm -hmm. So Valor is a, is a school um, that was founded by twin brothers one who had a traditional uh, background in, in education as a school leader, and then another who had a clinical background as a therapist and social worker over a decade. And together, they created this holistic model. And Darren Dixon, who has that clinical background, created the social-emotional model for the school that's deeply integrated into uh, the academic practice and culture climate. Um, but if you think about rigor within that social-emotional model, it's about those authentic, meaningful experiences that give students access to the skill, and then ongoing opportunities for practice and feedback. And I'll give you an example of within this school what it looked like to us when we visited. We did a round table with students, um, and you had kind of four or five uh, strange adults sitting around this table uh, and a bunch of sixth graders. 
And one of the young women was just dominating the conversation. She just had to answer every single question. She was so excited. And uh, Darren, who was kind of facilitating it, stopped and said, you know what? We're hearing a lot of your voice right now. I'd like you to step back and let your peers kind of weigh in. I don't know about you, but kind of me, uh, I would turn beet red, I would shut down. Um, that's, it's really hard to take that feedback, but I think what was really clear in that community was that it was such a regular practice. She didn't turn beet red, she didn't shut down. Um, she took the feedback and it gave the opportunity for her peers to weigh in. And that's rigorous attention to self-awareness and active listening that we see um, in a model like that. Mm -hmm. and I might emphasize one thing in what Brooke just said, which is to, to really deeply recognize that the mind's machinery is engaged with all of this at once, so that there's not like a totally separate part of your mind that's engaged with executing social and emotional skills or uh, trying to do attention work and so forth. This is all together. And that means the research on how do you alter the mind's capabilities applies to all of these different dimensions. It's not like there's a certain thing that's only for academics, and then there's some other way that you need to work on social and emotional learning. You need that practice and feedback. Yep. And then the other piece I'd say is, the, the trick is you use two words that are interesting. One is evidence and one is assessment. And the two are different. So all teachers use evidence all the time. They're watching students. They can see what's actually happening in the classrooms. An assessment often means a standalone separate task to generate some information. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do within CZI and with our partners and outwards is increasingly how do we use evidence for what's going on? How do we help teachers look for key things without stopping the flow of activities and instruction to do standalone things? Mm -hmm. So I think gathering evidence against a, a wide range of skills and capacities is what the best teaching already does. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's dive into the evidence because that also suggests data mm -hmm. and that suggests collecting a lot of data. And that kind of leads us to two questions. Number one is, you know, who really owns this data? And number two is, what about the equity issues that are involved in sometimes tracking people? Does that become a very, very dangerous territory to be in? Ev evidence use, tracking, privacy issues, yeah. um, these have become increasingly prominent across all areas of our society. I mean, the healthcare world is in some ways well ahead of us uh, in terms of having had lots of data now and electronic medical records for a while. And the key is really leave that evidence in control of the source. Yep. Le leave it out there as opposed to somehow trying to grab it or dominate it or whatever. I mean, CZI yeah. is just not, we're not getting evidence, we're not, we're not pulling it in, we're not using it for ourselves. We're working with partners to help them use their evidence for what they need to do with their students to improve the outcomes of students. And I want to really narrow in on another theme that you mentioned, which is equity. Yeah. Um, and so when we think about equity, we think about the impact of, of context on the individual as one key area that we need to de dedicate ourselves to. And so when you look at this framework, we know that the context that individuals are placed within is what impacts their development. If you're in the context of healthy, supportive relationships, mm -hmm. we see how that impacts development. And if you're in the context of trauma, or stress, right. or unhealthy physical conditions. That's where we see an impact on development. And so we are completely dedicated to supporting the development of skills in individuals, but never taking our eye off context. So fantastic if we can support uh, a strategy that builds a student's sense of belonging in the classroom. It's unacceptable to send that student back into an, an, an emotionally unsafe environment that has bias in it. Um, and so we don't think about teasing these things apart. And so when we think about uh, measurement, we're also looking at culture, climate, um, and adults around the students, not just the students themselves. So can you give me an example? I mean, what does this actually look like in a classroom then, or in practice? So if you think about uh, a buzz term out there called trauma-informed practice, mm -hmm. right? Um, if a student is experiencing trauma and adversity, um, they are going to need um, essentially what all students need, but like a deep focus on those close, trusting relationships that are consistent. And they also need consistency, predictability, safety around them. 
and an opportunity to make sure that they also have ownership of the space. Um, and so when you see schools that are building more consistency across classrooms, that are building space for students um, to, to move and, and self-regulate and um, de-escalate if they need to. Um, when you see a, a deep focus on ensuring that the teachers are checking in with those students and building a very strong relationship so every student has an adult in that building that knows them deeply um, and can share with other adults if something's going on. So if Brooke's going to that classroom later today, she's going to ensure that uh, the other teacher knows that something's going on at home and, and something might trigger her. So don't escalate along with her. Like here are some things that we need to be focused on. So that it's within classrooms and in, in schools that are deeply focused on this, between classrooms you see that consistency and focus on the child. Right. And again, this sounds like great teaching. This sounds mm -hmm. like what we've always wanted um, for our children and, and as educators. And so what you're saying is, okay, let's do it systematically. Is there a need for technology in this environment? Is there a need for using technology at all? Or is it just a way of creating a different culture in this environment? I don't think we have to choose between. I mean, okay. technology, again, is a tool. Right. And it can be a tool to support that student. And it can be a tool to support uh, adults in developing more meaningful relationships with students. You heard in the video yeah. um, that teacher is using that mentoring tool to more deeply understand and build space to, to cover certain topics with students. And let's talk about the adults for a minute because a lot of what we've been learning in social emotional development is that it's really hard for adults to be creating these environments if they either haven't experienced it or aren't they aren't living in it right now. So where does the uh, professional development or even kind of the culture of the school fit into this? Well, this has actually been a problem for quite a while where um, we, we haven't given teachers the advantage of professional development environments that are grounded on the fact that teachers have brains too, right? So all the things that we've been talking about and all of those dimensions of human development, they apply to people. This is not about students. There's not some age barrier where suddenly we become tape recorders. So in fact, this is a piece of the puzzle, which is you, you almost have to start working with the teachers first to embed them within a comprehensive human development environment that includes the support for the skill changes that they need, but also nourishes the rest of their development at the same time. I don't know if you want to talk about uh, Valor or something. I else. think uh, Valor is a great example. Um, you know, the, the way that they deliver part of that model is through what they call circles. And uh, these are spaces for students to develop those skills that I talked about, self-awareness, empathy. Um, but the process of those circles creates trust, vulnerability, and safety that sets that school up for success with learning. Darren and Todd realize they cannot ask that of their students if they don't ask the same thing of their teachers. Mm -hmm. So teachers go through the same exact circles weekly, mm -hmm. and you see the same exercises that they're going through to build their own skills in this area and to build trust and vulnerability amongst the adults that you then see driving rigor and learning in the classrooms. That's really interesting. Um, Talk a little bit about um, you know how far up the chain it has to go. Does it have to go? It goes to the teachers. It sounds like it's going to the school administration. How far up do we need to go? It has to actually go up pretty high. And part of the reason for that is um, whether it's a principal or a superintendent, those folks have to know enough about how learning and development work that they accept the space needed for the teachers to change their behaviors. And again. Teachers are going to need all kinds of different amounts of practice and feedback and support if you're asking them to do something very new in their own experience. Sometimes principals, superintendents assume, hey, as long as we get a couple of days in the summer, we're good to go with the school model transformation, right? Because they're all professionals, right? And having them understand also at their level, no, we need time. We need practice and feedback that's distributed throughout the school year for our staff in order to become good at doing those same things for their students. 
Um, the other reason for this is also purchasing behaviors, is when principals or superintendents are looking at new interventions or even new professional development, the saddest thing is when they bring in things well-meaning that they hope will work. I mean, there's nothing worse than a three-hour lecture on why three-hour lectures are not the right thing to do, right? Now, I've delivered those, but I'm just saying, okay, I'm just saying. And so it would be great if the principal superintendents and purchasers themselves had their own filters around uh, this uh, you know, whole learner, whole human development that they could then apply as they try to help their yeah. teachers with the hard work they have. And I would say, just like Bohr mentioned, you know, we don't kind of turn from whole child and whole adolescent to some other version of an adult. You know, when we talk about physically, emotionally safe environments where there's trust and vulnerability and communication, it's not just for schools. I mean, district office needs yeah. that. You know, it, it's any effective organization. It's not easy, but it's going to draw from these same principles. And I've got to start on the not easy part. I mean, is anyone here not interested in a school that works the way they've described? <laughs> Does anybody not want to be in that environment? How do we get there? And how do we get there in the context of all of the current things yep. that already take teachers and administrators 60 hours a week? Well, we, we are focused deeply on interdisciplinary partnership. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at this is, this is a holistic approach to learning and development, which means we can't just rely on traditional educators and traditional educational researchers to inform what design and school practice should look like. And so how are we pulling from experts in mental health? How are we pulling from pediatricians like Priscilla to inform what schools should be st structured like? Um, how are we pulling from social justice advocates and community organizers to help understand how context should really be informing what we um, do and say in schools? Um, so that evolution of kind of what we think of as the research practice partnership is one key uh, area that we're very focused on. Right. Now you also, um, actually this morning, announced a new set of grants. Um, and a lot of those grants are really aimed at research. A lot of them mm -hmm. are aimed at research and learning. What do you need to learn? What, what are we trying to still explore? Where do we need to find you know, more work? Yeah. There's, there's still so much that we don't know about how children and adolescents develop in some of these areas. So for example, there's a robust, incredible literature in adolescent sense of purpose, kind of how they see the role, their role in life beyond themselves. What we don't know is how we support development in early childhood and elementary years to focus on certain skills that are going to set students up for success with that mindset and that skill set in adolescence. And so we do have a basic research agenda at CZI that's focused on better understanding trajectories toward that sense of purpose and trajectories along um, emotional intelligence and how, you know, when do uh, students start to differentiate between anger and frustration? In order to kind of get to the rigor that we were talking about earlier, right. we have to understand those developmental trajectories so we can design early childhood through commencement level supports. I'd also say we have to do a number of things, and again, these are along the lines of trying pilots to, to begin to provide teachers with the tools and uh, decision-making capabilities grounded in evidence that can really help them. So one of our partners uh, is NeuroTeach uh, Global, which we gave a grant a while ago to, that is now developing uh, training modules and a whole tiered set of these, starting with very simple, short, uh, smartphone-based examples of uh, teaching circumstances in which a learning science principle can make a major difference. They've been piloting this in a number of different uh, school districts, and their plan is to build up a set of modules all the way to the point where teachers can actually submit videos of themselves uh, w working with learning science principles and get feedback from peers and some experts around how is this going. Um, we're also working uh, with places like uh, Transcend, which try to help folks who are building new school models to right from the get-go incorporate principles of learning science, whole child development, changes in identity, grounded in evidence so that as people have the ambition to make a major change, let's say, that they really do it standing on the shoulders of what we already have learned as much as we can. Now, the one thing to be very careful about would, all this... Oh, just on that note, I, the, there's a great partner that we have who works with Transcend as well, 
um, Cynthia Robinson Rivers, who's a principal at Van Ness Elementary um, in the Can District of Columbia. Remind us where Van Ness Elementary is. Um, it's a district school in in DC. Perfect. Um, and uh, her partnership with Transcend helped her to understand the importance of practice. And so she's done a phenomenal job of thinking about what an equity-driven social emotional culture climate and instructional model looks like. Um, and through the partnership with Transcend, she realized, uh, per my example earlier, um, that she, she was giving students the space to self-regulate and kind of, um, you know, uh, de-escalate if they needed to, but she wasn't, she was just kind of sending them off to do it as though they had that skill, right? And so she realized that it, inc it needed that practice, they needed the practice right. and supports for it. So right. that partnership translated directly into the way that she's improving her model. So that's a great example of someone who had a great practice and just maybe needed a little bit more uh, pieces to yeah. tie it together. Um, so some of the questions from the audience are, are uh, very much on point. And probably the hardest one is, so how do you assess? How do you evaluate the success or the impact on the non-academic development? So it is imperfect right now. I, I mean, researchers do have tools that they use to study non-academic capabilities. But a lot of those tools are things like self-report surveys. And they actually work well as one shot for research the problem is, if you keep giving students the same question over and over again, are you gritty, are you gritty, are you, they're eventually gonna say, I take showers all the time, I guess I'm gritty, what, what do you mean? Okay, the answer is yes, right? They don't work as a reliable indicator over time. So this is an active area of a lot of folks' uh, investigation and research, is how do we get better evidence around this? But the other side of it, there are also uh, uh, results in schools that you can use to see, well, what is the climate of a school? How is that changing over time? Uh, there's evidence that comes from uh, behaviors that are happening in the schools that you can use to monitor what's actually happening over time. But this is an area that's, uh, that's not simple right now in terms of looking for uh, solid evidence about how learners are doing. So it's self-reporting, it's climate of the school, these kinds of survey sorts of questions. Um, anything else that, that well, at this point, is at least a starting point? You can use, uh, so beyond self-reports, you can use a, a method called experience sampling. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's asking students uh, to report on potentially their emotional safety um, and their emotional state, but doing it at different times of the day so you can start to see patterns. Um, and that kind of, again, it's, it's a self-report, but you start to see, wow, at, you know, in the morning, Brewer's feeling pretty excited and happy, and in the afternoon, he starts to get um, pretty lethargic in this person's classroom. And so you can start to see the patterns uh, that students um, are reporting in, the, in these areas. And so it's beyond that snapshot self-report. And, and again, that uh, uses technology to do that so that you can do it during the day at sort of any time. Um, and there's other things that are being done with technology. Uh, Ryan Baker is a researcher uh, now at the University of Pennsylvania who has worked for years on how do we link behaviors and evidence of people working in uh, technology-enhanced environments, can we link those to observations around affect, around are they confused, are they uh, excited, are they uh, uh, upset, are they bored? And he's been able to show there are some ways to actually use the, the detailed interaction data, they call it click streams, to actually start to make uh, detectors to help teachers understand which students, when they're working with technology-based interventions, how are they doing during these things? So let me, re and I want to reinforce success. Like I, I, I think we've mentioned this a number of times. We don't just look at the student, right? We're looking at the context around them, the, the competencies of the adults around them. And so success isn't just narrowing it right down to like, you know, student skills in this area. Again, we're really focused on the context around them as well. Right, and how to help the teachers right. continue to make changes and be aware of what's happening to each student in the classroom, because yep. they have that critical role of being able to do that. So. And again, asking questions of the students, doing the self-reporting to try to get a sense of what that context yep. is. Mm -hmm. And yet, doing that in an environment where you're protecting the data because it's some of that data. context of is really, really... The data tested. should be no different than academic data. Mm -hmm. It's student data. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk about something very practical for people here. Let's say people here want to do professional development around some of these subjects. 
and they're not yet part of a great study. We'll talk about how to become part of a study, but <laughs> where do they go? What should they be looking at? What are resources that currently exist that you know, are within, within reach of any teacher? Well, I think, um, you know, just like Bohr mentioned in some other areas, we are on the frontier in the whole child space here as well. Um, but we are partnering with you know, folks like Bar Darren and Todd at Valor to think about what does it look like to build professional development models that help other schools think about what those circles and that social emotional model could look like in their own. Um, but what we found to be most impactful with adults right now in the, in the whole child space and in looking at social emotional development or identity development is focusing on their own skills in this area. Um, there's nothing more impactful than seeing and feeling the, the impact of, of professional development that's helping you understand how you relate to others and what your attachment style is. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's an area that we've seen a lot of traction and a lot of response from teachers and leaders. And I would emphasize this is part of what that, uh, the, the grant that we've been just giving out recently, part of its point is to actually show well, what does it look like to actually integrate all of these things together in one place? And so we want to make it more visible, make it uh, more clearly available to teachers to see, I get all these characteristics. What does it look like, in fact, to do this? Um, we're also working with ISTE uh, on uh, piloting some different training modules that could then become available as well. I mentioned the NeuroTeach Global Resources. That's another way we're trying to see, can we make this broadly accessible to folks? Uh, in some way to at least get started. Um, there's a number of printed resources, but of course the problem with those is, you know, reading about things like this just isn't the same as actually getting the practice yeah. to get it going. And but the grants that we announced today are building off of efforts that we've supported with partners in the philanthropic space for the last few years. The National Commission on Social Emotional Academic Development out of the Aspen Institute, right. um, a, a number of partners who have been dedicated to synthesizing the science of learning and development and taking those reports right. and those findings and thinking about how we actually move them closer and closer to practice. And so one of the, the efforts will be led by the Learning Policy Institute mm -hmm. to then think about how all of these findings and recommendations from different areas of science are actually, um, should be, um, informing teacher certification and teacher accreditation. Mm -hmm. um, and that, if that's moving into policy, it's going to push um, more urgency around professional development in this mm -hmm. area. So a growing number of papers, as you said, some from the Aspen Institute, also Edutopia, I think. You've supported some work that they've done about going into classrooms and actually chronicling in video some of these practices, yeah, They work right? directly with the partners um, at the Aspen uh, Seed Commission and the Science of Learning and Development partners to then take um, what they were learning and what they were putting in these phenomenal reports and making it much more accessible um, through visual uh, materials for, for practitioners, mm -hmm. right? A um, couple of other questions here. Um, you've used the word feedback a lot. Is it all critical? Are there positive, what are, you know, how, do, the, the, the question says, you know, feedback is ineffective if, if it's all critical. Um, what about the positive? That it's, I think that's a, a that's it's mindset, right? And so um, I think outside of the academic space, if, if we're looking at feedback around social emotional skills, because we, we tend to think that these aren't skills sometimes that need to be developed in practice, we take feedback as perhaps a character assassination or something that we take so personally because we can't change it. And what about when we apply it to schools? I mean, what about when we, you know, we, a lot of this conversation is about telling them to change their practices. And so, you know, are there other examples of schools that maybe you haven't even worked with yet that have practices that should be amplified and encouraged? Yeah, we, we've uh, spent the last two years and have been very privileged to learn from many schools that have been doing this for decades. So we don't want to communicate today that kind of we're reinventing a wheel or some kind of flower framework. Um, it's been done in a number of schools. It hasn't been um, explicit because we've focused on frameworks and accountability systems that prioritize academic outcomes. And so a lot of this practice is very tacit um, and we need to get in there and, and understand how to make it clearer. But uh, another school, you know, you asked about you know, examples of this. 
is the Science uh, and Mathematics Institute in Tacoma. Mm -hmm. So it's a high school, a district high school, um, embedded in a zoo. And um, they were founded in 2009, so you know, decade before we were sitting up here talking about these things. Um, and the rigor that is uh, available to those students by kind of embedding instruction in the zoo and aquarium um, through like meaningful application there. They also are able to focus on other whole child aspects. So um, as students master Spanish skills in, in language classes, they become bilingual docents mm -hmm. for members of the community that they're there to kind of visit the zoo. And so that builds civic identity. It, it helps students understand that they are part of a larger community and that they, in being embedded in a civic institution, they start to understand how they're giving back to that community. And that's an example of this kind of multi-dimensional work where the same thing around bilingualism and practicing Spanish is just deeply connected to something that is of real value and interest in the community itself. There's no separation between these things, and so that provides motivation. I'd add one more thing on the feedback side, which is, you know, feedback which is wrong, period. That, I mean, that's not really what the research shows is effective feedback, right? right. So <laughs> the, the, the feedback you need is, is, well, what can you act on? What, what are things that allow you to change what you do the next time to do it better, right? Whether it's coaching in an athletic or coaching in an artist or even doing another uh, you know, writing piece, another essay, it's actionable things, not just nice language, you know, more creative words next time. It's something that you can act on and actually begin to, you know, get coaching on and get detailed feedback on. And I would argue the same thing is true at a school level, that it's not enough to just get a, you know, an assessment back of, you know, where are you on a scale? You really need what are the next actions that make the most sense, given our context, how we've achieved so far, what, what do we do next? and then try to tighten the, the time, try to tighten the cycle of feedback and practice and feedback and practice. Mm -hmm. And who gives all of that feedback to the schools? Where should it be coming from? I mean, you know, there are hundreds of schools, for instance, using the Summit platform. There's uh, lots and lots of schools that we've sort of talked about today. We write about a lot of these schools. Where, where should they be getting the feedback from? I think all members of their community, yeah. parents, okay. teachers, okay. students. Uh, we have a partner school in Oakland, Roses and Concrete. It's a community school, and they use a tool called a priority survey in partnership with uh, the Teaching Excellence Network. Mm -hmm. And the survey includes dozens of research-based practices um, that the school could prioritize from standard, you know, are we aligning our instruction to the standards? Are we valuing and representing the students' culture and family? Are we using technology effectively in the classroom? It, it includes, are you using humor in the classroom? Um, but the way that they administer that survey is by asking parents, faculty, and students to prioritize out of that list of 20 plus to, to seven. And so when we talk about priorities, we talked a little bit about equity. The leading question that you know the audience is asking is, so. If uh, CZI is, with all of this work, how do we address questions of institutional racism? How do we get to what is perhaps at the core of some of the most profound inequities yeah. that exist? It's a tough question that we'll continue to, to explore how we approach. I'll give you a couple of things. One is, um, uh, much of the research that drives how we understand trauma and adversity um, was done in the 90s, um, and it was research on adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. They included abuse, neglect, instability, and what we have learned from those contexts that student our children experienced um, in terms of the impact it had on educational health and other life outcomes was profound. But that's an incomplete picture of adversity. Systemic bias is, is adversity, and so we're thinking back in that basic research agenda, how do we explore um, a more comprehensive picture of what that looks like for, uh, for students who are, are developing in our systems? Um, and then we're also thinking deeply about um, how we continue to explore defining a broader definition of success through that equity lens. And 
a really critical piece of a commitment to equity is who's defining the outcomes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a subset of our community or population, but how are we making sure that all voices and perspectives are represented at a table when we say what those outcomes should be? So is there a project? How do you do that within CZI? Is there one project? Are there multiple projects? How does well, that become integral? To so one way that, that we are uh, incorporating those ideas into our projects is, you know, again, it's working with the adults in the rooms of various kinds, the various grantees. How do we make sure that they also are deeply thinking about equity issues in the hypotheses they have, in the audiences they're talking to, and really fundamentally in the problems that they're actually defining and as you said, Brooke, how will they know if there's success? But, but if I so, could be, a, you know, push back a little bit. If you say, how do we make sure the people sitting at that table are defining that, but are those the people who are living the problem then? Well, exactly. That's one of the ways that you alter what's happening is by making sure folks are at the table who have the lived experience that's necessary. And so it's things like, and again, this is some work that's been going on in healthcare for a while too, you, you bring folks from the community right to the front end of defining a project or even potentially evaluating proposals for new projects so that they can weigh in on whether this makes any sense to their community and what they experience as members of that community. It's as also, to later. if I could say, it's, it's a deep commitment to how we stay alert to how we might be um, restricting that table. And so if we think about this broader definition of success as um, financial stability in young adulthood, in addition to health, purpose and fulfillment, participation in democracy, um, we're asking ourselves, what does that still require of certain Americans in our society to leave behind? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we do a lot of grant making, but we also do a lot of convening. And so we have, uh, you know, a roundtable planned with key partners to ask that question, to make sure that we aren't driving ahead with a definition of success that is not looking at what um, certain Americans in our society are, are experiencing. And I have to ask, a, again, a rude question, but let's say there are people out here in the audience that want to be part, that want to put their hands up and say either, I want my school to change, I want to be part of a study, I want to be part of a round table. How do they get their names in the bucket? So uh, probably around the middle of the year, we'll be releasing a series of RFPs that are open to the public. Um, and they, they're really going to focus on a number of questions that are connected to expanding those partnerships between educators and researchers and practitioners in all of these different spaces. And so we'd really encourage people to look out for those um, because, they, again, they will be open RFPs. Mm -hmm. I, another question uh, that, again, we had, we saw before the framework and all of the multiple elements that surround context, any individual person, where, where do they start? The questioner says, how does a practitioner realistically address all of those elements? And I would say, how do they even decide which of those elements to start with? I think it's right back to your community, um, you know, to see what, where there's passion and interest and traction. Um, you know, I, I see another question about, you know, these examples really only pulling from parts of that framework. Um, look, a, a, a child, an adolescent, an adult live in a 24-hour cycle. You know, we don't expect every single school in America to bring in a, a working health clinic and do all of these things um, to completion. The long-term goal is to really think about that 24-hour cycle of the individual and how we support development in all of these areas across that. But I think um, you know, where, um, whether you're designing a school or thinking about bringing in partners, um, it's really about what the, the team is excited, where they see a need in this space, and finding that authentic partner to come in and just get something started. And this is early stage stuff, but one thing that's worth being clear about is that multi-dimensional array that you saw, it's not intended to imply you need a separate activity for each of those dimensions. That in fact, the way teaching has always worked is as you're doing an activity for one purpose, can you modify it so that it can serve multiple purposes? So you can do a math activity around, I don't know, building some fluency it can 
the way you do it can destroy a student's identity as a math-using human being, or it can actually reinforce the idea that you can be successful at this. You are successful at this. Look at the progress you're making. And, uh, and even by modifying the activity further, you may be able to help them with uh, uh, self-regulation and some of the cognitive functioning skills at the same time as you're working on fluencies. So this is the kind of the brave frontier of work that I think teachers, by becoming informed about how learning actually works and human development works, can begin to think about their practice to say, I'm doing some great work in writing. Now, how do I modify that to make some uh, uh, good inroads on the other dimensions of students as well? And that's how it actually, I think, looks in the best classrooms. Right. It's not all chopped up. Right. It's an integrated piece. And what's interesting is often, if you don't know what you're looking for, you don't realize how many things are happening at once in the way a great teacher is working with his or her students um, uh, that, that it is hitting on multiple of those uh, areas at once. And that's part of what we want to make more visible and more accessible to all teachers. That's great. So the last practical question is, what's the one thing that you hope that everyone here will think about differently next week or even do differently next week when you're home, when you're back in your context and in the daily craziness that we all have? What's the one thing that you hope they might think about or do differently? Uh, I hope that uh, all of you, whether you're a school practitioner or work with an organization connected to school practice or district practice um, or any other educational practice, think outside the box and think, think about that, that framework and pursue a conversation or a partnership in a, with an unlikely partner, you know, maybe in the mental health space, maybe in social psychology, maybe in healthcare, um, to start to think about what they might bring to your practice to move it toward that whole child perspective. And I think from my perspective, what I'd say to all of you is, give yourselves the grace of owning a brain, right? What does that mean? I, I, <laughs> meaning, as you think about changing your practice, don't be surprised if it's hard. If the first time you try a new method of teaching or, or, or supporting students feels uncomfortable and strange, don't use that as a signal that you're no good at this or that this is too hard for me, but give yourselves the grace of space and time to do the practice, get a coach to help you become better at any of these things. And I would argue the same is for an administrator or a principal. Sure. Give yourselves the time to try these things as opposed to, well, I read the book, I tried it once, this doesn't work for me. That's just not the way minds work. So I would really commend that to all of you. And I'll make one last ask, which is that we're trying to write these stories. And so, as you think about your practice, if you are see in your practice, here's how I'm living this. Here's how I'm starting to build these practices. Here's how I'm taking what I do, maybe adding a little bit to it. Drop us a note. Tell us about it. We want to share your stories because we deeply believe that only by sharing our stories will we collectively begin to figure this out as well. Please join me in thanking Warren Brooks.